1899, Charles H. Jewell, the commissioner of the US Patent Office, reportedly said this, everything that can be invented has been invented in 1899. How could he have gotten it so spectacularly wrong? In my opinion, it's because he didn't take this person into account, the unreasonable man. George Bernard Shaw, Irish playwright and philosopher said, the reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable man expects the world to adapt to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man. Of course, this kind of saying would be, today, if we were to say this, it would be politically incorrect and also wholly untrue. It is the unreasonable person that changes the world. The men and women that decide to go against convention, the people that decide that they will not accept the status quo. People like Mother Teresa or indeed Gandhi who liberated 340 million Indians from British rule. That is unreasonable thinking. Now, it turns out Charles H. Duell didn't actually say that. It was misquoted. In fact, nobody actually said that quote. Some reason the poor man was attributed to saying this, which is a good thing because only four short years later, man took off the first ever heavier than, than air flying machine. But there are some interesting quotes where people really did get it wrong. Let's look at some of these together. I'm really excited to share these with you. The horse is here to stay, but the automobile is only a novelty, a fad. This was a president of a bank. He gave this advice to uh, Henry Ford's lawyer, a man named Horace Rockman. Now, um, he ignored the advice and invested $5,000 in Henry Ford stock and later sold it for $12.5 million. The horse is here to stay. Heavier than air flying machines are impossible. This is Lord Kelvin. He said this in circa 1895, and we saw that within less than a decade, this was made possible. The airplane that you see here is the Antonov AN-225 which has a takeoff uh, tonnage of over 640 tons. Heavier than air flying machines are impossible. This telephone has too many shortcomings to be considered as a serious means of communication. This is an internal memo in Western Union, 1876. Fascinating. Now, I have to make a confession. It's easy to look back at these guys and laugh. I remember when the first, and some of you might be too young to remember this, but I remember that when the first Nokia phone with a camera came out, you guys remember that? Yeah? This was 2002, 2003, I think. I remember one of my team members came up to me and said, Sensei, look at this awesome phone. It has a camera and a phone. And I thought it was the most ridiculous thing in the world. First of all, the resolution was really low in those days. And also, I thought to myself, look, if, you're gonna want to, if you want to take a picture, you take a camera with you. Why would you combine it into your phone? You know? So it's easy for us to make these mistakes. I remember when Twitter came out. Twitter, I thought, was the most idiotic thing in the world. Who wants to write these 144 character messages? Today, I think I have 15,000 followers on Twitter. Same thing when Facebook came out. I thought it was really, really bad. So I'm making fun of those guys, but you know, I have to look in the mirror as well. Who the hell wants to hear actors talk? This is H.M. Warner in 1927. Who the hell wants to hear actors talk? Now, you have to remember the context. This was set in the 1920s in the era of silent films. And movies were considered, the art was, was, was seen through the aesthetic expression. So sound was seen as a distraction. Why would you want to put sound in there? Why would you want to ruin the experience? In fact, even someone as genius as Charlie Chaplin, he resisted sound in movies for years. He refused to accept sound in movies and only begrudgingly, slowly accepted that sound was introduced, music, and eventually dialogue. So even geniuses like Charlie Chaplin get it wrong. And I love this one. There's no chance that the iPhone is going to get any significant market share. No chance. Then Microsoft CEO um, 
uh, what was his name? I don't even remember his name. Steve Ballmer in 2007. All right. So um, it shows you how wrong people can get it and how dangerous it is if you don't take into, consider, into consideration the unreasonable person. Never underestimate the unreasonable person. The unreasonable people change the world. And even things we take for granted today, like seat belts. We all have seat belts in our cars. In the 1950s, there were no seat belts in cars. And it was a guy called Ralph Nader who campaigned and campaigned and lobbied and lobbied until he made them law. This man literally saved millions of lives. He's an unreasonable thinker. Steve Jobs, an unreasonable thinker. So the lesson is never underestimate the unreasonable person and never underestimate the importance and the danger of innovation. If you're comfortable right now, you're in trouble. If you're doing business the same way you did a year ago, you're in trouble. Never underestimate the importance of innovation. Now, having said that, I want to share some what I call golden rules of innovation, my thoughts on, on uh, innovation. Number one, innovation is not necessarily technology related. More importantly, it's a mindset. Innovation is a mindset. And it can be something very simple and mundane. It can be something like updating your filing system. That's, that's an innovation. Or it can be a new, martial, a new belt system in a martial arts school. This is exactly what I did some years ago. I owned a martial arts school many years ago. I, world, I trained in London under world champion. Came back to Bahrain, fresh with my black belt. I started my own school. I was teaching people, and I realized I couldn't teach this curriculum because it was very instructor heavy. In London, there were many, many instructors on the floor all the time. But with me, it was, it was, I was alone. I didn't know what to do. So I said, you know what? I've got to change the curriculum. I've got to change the belt system. And you might think it's common sense, but for a martial artist to change the belt system that he got from his master, that he got from his master, that he got from his master, that he got from Adam, yeah, is not an easy thing to do. So for me, this was a big, big thing to do. So innovation is a mindset. Remember, the only thing that is constant is change. If you're comfortable with this thought, if you make it part of your regular thinking, the only thing that's constant is change. Don't get too comfortable. Don't be bound or imprisoned by what others are doing in your industry. And this is what happens, especially in our part of the world, is all, everyone in the industry is sitting in a, in a circle looking inside. They're all looking inside the circle. And this is very dangerous. You don't get to see anything new. Someone every now and then must turn around and see what is happening outside of the industry. Not only that, what is happening on the technologi technological horizon in the next that will change my industry or disrupt my industry in the next five to 10 years. What we did some years ago, I had a, I had a business called the Dream Body Center. It was a fitness and weight loss center. And I wanted to do something to improve our operations. We weren't at the level that, that um, we should be at. So um, I called up the franchisee of one of the world's biggest fast food chains. I won't say which one. OK. And, and uh, I called him and said, look, I want to come to your kitchen, and we want to learn from you guys. And I promise you, I will never get into the food restaurant, the food business. I'm not interested in opening a restaurant. We just want to learn. And he said, Sahil, you're like my son. Please come in. But I can't give you any manuals, or you can't take any copies. No, no. I said, we don't want to. So we went into the fast food place. We went into the kitchen. We saw how the ketchup gun operated. We saw how the mustard gun operated. We saw how the two, uh, the double-sided grill operated. We saw the milkshake machine. We saw the french fries scooping thing. And we learned something interesting. We learned that in this place, every hour, they go to every station, and they calibrate all the machines every hour. And then every other hour or so, they do a trouble path checklist. And we were really impressed. So we went back, and we said, we need to introduce some of these checklists. And we introduced eight different checklists a day. Opening checklist, handover checklist, closing checklist, and two trouble paths per shift. We had eight checklists per day. And, there, and that, to me, was so profound and so important because instead of being reactive, we are proactive. Is the toilet flushing? Is the light on? Are all the faucets working? These are simple things. We didn't learn it from looking inside. We looked at it from learning, looking outside of the industry. Okay? So don't be bound in prisons by what others are doing in your industry. Four, don't be afraid of failing. 
and especially you young guys, when your parents tell you, do the right thing, go to school, you go to university, you get a job, play it safe, Habibi, you know, la, you're supposed to fail. You're supposed to fail. How are you supposed to learn? And, and without realizing, you've been failing all your life. How did you learn how to walk? It's because you fell a hundred times until you learned how to walk. Same thing with riding a bike. And some of you probably, or most of you heard the analogy. If you are taking off from a plane from Bahrain to London, the plane is off course over 90% of the time. So it's failing 90% of the time, but finally it gets there. Don't be afraid of failure. Make innovation part of your culture, part of your DNA. This is really, really important. I think what makes a successful, innovative company is the fact that it's part of the DNA. And this is exactly what we do in FELIC. FELIC Consulting is a values-based, purpose-driven strategy consultancy. Our values are enshrined in this Feliconian way. We define ourselves as innovators and problem solvers who are obsessed with finding a better way. Our purpose is to build stronger economies and happier societies by unlocking business and human potential. And we mean it. When we say this, we mean it. In fact, this summit is part of our purpose, is to make people, to help people unlock the potential that they have. We have seven guiding principles. Number one is teamwork, teamwork, teamwork. Number two, we treat everybody with dignity and respect. Number three, we are proactive and professional. Number four, we communicate all the time. Number five, smile, have fun. Number six, we provide amazing customer experiences. And number seven is constant and never-ending improvement. We are obsessed about constant and never-ending improvement. In fact, if we did something the same a quarter ago, we are not happy with ourselves. We're always innovating. Every quarter might be some two, three, four, five, six small changes, or might be two or three big changes, but we're always changing. When we have our monthly investment innovation lab, I ask my team, one of my agenda items is, what are you learning right now? And we share. Someone might say, I'm just watching a documentary. Well, what did you learn in that documentary? What else, what, what, what can you share with us? Constant and never-ending improvement. It's in our DNA. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the FEDEC Unreasonable Thinking Summit. Thank you. Thank you.